from there. All right. Thank you, Tanya, and uh, welcome everyone. Good morning. Um, and I will also say thanks to my colleagues, Sergey and Joey, for helping us out today. So uh, they are all very experienced people. And uh, the session today is about Shell. So let me start by sharing my screen first. So I'm just going to share my full desktop. All right. Uh, okay. Um, can you see my screen, Tanya? Yes, I can. Okay. All right. I Thank you. You have three windows, right? Yeah. Yeah. So this one is just like uh, uh, I've just opened up this uh, window. Just for the completeness, if you are going to use the login cluster, or sorry, the Magic Castle cluster. So these are the logins. So you can pick any one of them. Uh, make sure if you were there in yesterday's session, so make sure you just go to that same place. Or if you are new today, then you can pick up any of the vacant spots here. And um, the, the login is like login command is right there given in front of uh, this this thing SSH user zero one seven like that and then this is the password right there and uh, that's all we need for today so I'm just going to minimize this window and uh, you can see um, this is what we are going to do today. So the setup as Tanya suggested for Windows, we need mobile term or if you are using a Mac, then all you have to do is open up a terminal like you can see on the left side of my screen there. And yeah, that's what we are going to use today. Uh, I am working on Mac, so I'll be just simply opening up a terminal there. And then uh, again, something that Tanya mentioned, so the Zoom reactions um that we'll be using today so if you want me to slow down or if you want me to repeat something you can use any of those reaction buttons so they are right there um uh, in the in the zoom there um uh, the zoom settings and uh, typically we would ask for like the green check mark or a red cross mark if something is not clear or if you are not with us so those are the two important ones. And, and yeah, so if you have any questions, please raise your hand or you can just press that raise hand button there. And uh, as I said, that uh, login to the training cluster. So if you have an Alliance account, uh, you are welcome to do the session on the actual cluster. Uh, this is where I'll be doing actual cluster. I'll be working on Narval, but if you don't have an Alliance account, then obviously you can use the training cluster, um, the Magic Castle, the logins have been given to you. And if there are any questions, please let us know. So yesterday uh, we learned about uh, introduction to Linux commands. And today we will use those commands and try to do something a bit more meaningful. And uh, I mean, not that those commands were not uh, in isolation. I mean, they are the backbone of everything that we do on the cluster. Uh, but uh, today we are going to learn something, how to automate our programs or how to make use of the supercomputing resources more efficiently. And, uh, and yeah. So as we, as Tanya has mentioned that uh, what is ASNET, so I'll probably just skip over this slide. We are a nonprofit organization. We have access to tons of uh, CPUs, GPUs, and petabytes of storage. And yeah, I'll just skip this slide for now. All right, so this is where the actual lesson now begins. Um, most of us have been through this cycle at some point of our lives and if you have not very soon you will be i can promise that <laughs> a typical year in the life of a grad student is like that 
someone or your or your your professor asks you to write a program or gives you a program asks you to modify that program and then you do that and then you run it on all the test inputs right to see if it gives some desired results or if it is working at all or many other things and then you tabulate the results and derive some meaningful conclusions from it and if it is good enough then you send it out for publication and you get a medal in the form of a publication if it is not good enough you basically have to repeat the cycle again right the cycle moves on for n number of probably months or maybe years and that's uh the main part is right here right we have to run any modification that we make to this program onto all the test inputs so that is what we are going to do today so we will have bunch of test inputs and we will see our small demo program are we able to modify it in such a way that we just have to submit the job once and it runs through all the test inputs in a way that is more efficient than the standard procedure that we probably will all think about. And then we tabulate the results in a fashion that we want. Uh, like if we want to present some results, we are not going to present as we get them from the computer itself. So sometimes we need to modify the numbers in certain fashion. So how can we do that? So this is all we are going to learn today. So uh, the down, uh, to start the whole thing is like just log on to the login cluster. And this is the command that you probably uh, should just copy paste. Uh, oops, sorry. So this, this is the this is the file that we need for today. So I'm just going to um, uh, I, I don't know if, if there is a way, but I'll just like let me type it on w get then https. I'm just going to copy uh, this command and paste it onto the chat box there. You can simply open up a terminal and then you can simply download this file there. Or Sergey or Joey, if you can copy paste faster than me, please do that. Demo releases. And I'll then... type it into the chat. Oh, you have typed it into chat? Yeah. Yeah. Thanks. So download, let me see, this was working and it should work. Scripting dot zip. So if I do that, so it's going to download this whole thing for me and uh, right, there we go. So don't forget the wget. Uh, the first thing uh, that will enable you to download this file onto your computer. And having said that, I realized that I have not logged onto the cluster yet. So let me do that first. So SSH at the rate, I'm just going to work on Narval today. Dot alliance scan dot CA and uh, so I'm logging it from the first time. So it's going to ask me for my password so i enter my password and then it's going to ask for the second factor authentication so i have yubikey with me so i'm just going to press on the yubikey stick so now i am logged on to narwhal so the message of the day it's right there in front of me so this cluster will not be available from october 1st till october 15th there is a planned outrage but that's okay so I'm just going to go to, I've already downloaded this file. So I'm just going to go to straight to the directory where I have this file downloaded. And right there, so this you can see I've already downloaded and unzipped scripting here. So I'm just going to the scripting directory. And 
and in the scripting directory, I have these files with me. Now, I will wait for, I will pause for a minute and I will ask everyone if they are able to reach to this point where they can see these files in the scripting directory. And please give us green check marks. Okay. Wait. Oh, okay. And we will also be interested in if you are not able to do that, then please press the red cross button. So then we can help you out. All right. Um, any problems face, faced by anyone? Uh, give us a red cross mark then. Else, I will think that we all have the files with us or the directory with us. So yeah, so we will be using these uh, uh, example files for the lesson today. So let, okay, so I'll just continue to roll on from here. So in this case, you can see like there are a bunch of files and if I press, if I do this ls minus ltr, so it will, it will list down all the files along with the file permissions. And then we see, um, and then we see these files whereby there is this X written here, and there is only one file in this particular case. So this X stands for an executable file. Now, on some of the some of the machines, we have the color coding enabled. So this executable file is usually printed in green, but not here. So, uh, so yeah, but like you can check. Uh, the permissions of the files with this particular command or there are multiple ways as well ls minus l it stands for the long format of printing and uh, this the first three are the user permissions so the user in this case you or me here so i have got the read permission write permission and executable permission and these three permissions are for the group members and then these the last three set of permissions are for the outside world and this first blank that you see if it is a directory then you will see a lowercase d over there as well so we have got one executable file and the thing about executable file is you can run your job there so let's try to run the job and I will just type new mall and then I'll simply press enter. Oops. So it says the it says command not find. So we need to specify where exactly to find the input. And in this case, it will be like dot means here, right here in at that same directory location, and then slash new mall. If I do that. I see still nothing actually happening. So if you happen in to go into that case, so you should just press Control and C. Control C will bring you out of this loop. So the thing about this program is it requires an input file as well. So the thing is uh, new mall dot slash new mall, and I will give an input to it. So if I do that dot slash new all, and this is how you can give the input. This is called as the redirectional operator from where you actually read the input. And if I press enter here, so we see the program is now running and it has printed an output. So that is one way. And uh, as I said, this is just like a tiny test program. Uh, and, but we will be dealing with these programs today only. Now, uh, basically most programs take the input and then they produce an output as well. In this case, it's like a two-lined output so we can print it on the screen, but not every time this is the desired thing to do. So we 
most times we prefer to print the output onto an output file. And uh, the way to do that is you still do the same thing. Methane dot in. This is the reading redirectional operator. And now this redirectional operator is to direct the output. And I'm just going to direct the output to a file called as methane dot out here. And then it will get the input from methane dot in and it's going to print the output onto methane dot out. And I'll see ls minus LTR. So there is this file created methane dot out. ls minus LTR is like my favorite command. It's because it lists the directory or the files in the ascending order. So the most recent file gets printed right at the bottom here. And there's like a time as well over there. So methane dot out. So we got uh, this output written onto the methane dot out file. Okay, so if we, now we can see like there is this methane, ethane, and propane here in this case. So if we are going to tweak these programs and if there are like 200 different files, there is the one way which is not incorrect is to do is to run this job for onto on onto all the input files right here i write methane dot out i can do that for ethane dot out and then ethane dot in and it will give me the result right but that's not is the desired way right if there are 200 or maybe even more than that inputs. We are not going to do that each time. We are not going to sit on the front of the computer and do that. So there is a way to automate the, this kind of procedure, right? So that's what the goal with shell scripting is. So it like this procedure basically is slow. It is error prone. Uh, someone like me, I do make a lot of mistakes while typing. So if there is something wrong, then this is not going to work. And the worst part is I am actually running this on, on the login node of the cluster. So login node of the cluster is really a very busy zone, right? All the people are logged on there. So if someone from people like us, if we are running jobs over there, so it's going to make the overall uh node very very busy and very very slow for everyone so the best thing is if we are running on the cluster run it run your jobs on the compute nodes and uh, how do we run on the compute node that's where, where we have these uh, scripts uh which are like tiny you know well-defined job scripts that we use and they put our job not on the login node but on the compute node so Let's keep moving here. Oops. Yeah. So we could modify the program to take as many input files, uh, but like within the program itself, there may not be much that you would want to change. Sometimes some programs are given to you from, they come from somewhere else. They were written probably a few years back and then I mean, you don't know how to modify them, how to parallelize them. So that's where, but you can run several copies of that same code at the same time. So that's where these scripts would be very handy. And uh, the codes, what we are going to see today, they are not very long and lengthy, but uh, they still need a bit of practice to get used to them. But once you are able to write them, so you will see like you are able to run multiple copies of your code or do data analysis simultaneously over many different files and get a statistical answer very easily as such. So uh, there is already a script file which is there in the, when you download that scripting.zip file. So that file is called as run new mall. So this is like the way to see what is there inside. I tend to use this command a lot. So uh, 
so this run new mall is like our first script so if i type cat and then run new mall so this is going to show me what is written in the file so this is a very tiny file uh it just contains two lines that's what we did and uh, it has got two lines over there the first one this is called as hash bang and then bin bash so this essentially is the boilerplate so i mean most times you will simply copy this first line and put onto every script file that you are going to write this basically is a direction to where the executables are located as such so the real script is is from here like in this case it's just like one lined script so dash a dot slash new mall and then there is a redirectional operator and then the second redirectional operator so this is like a very tiny script and we can run this bash script by this command bash and i can say bash run new mall here and it's going to run and keep in mind that these bash scripts are not super fast they tend to be slow but because they are not very long so we are okay with them and then if i star if i do this ls star dot out so there is this methane dot out that has been generated and uh, uh, the same output will be uh, written onto the methane dot out so this is our script which is now um, in encompassed in this red zone here and then uh but we are we did something to the script i mean like we did we did write our command onto a file but still we are writing the methane there twice right and if we have to change this script for ethane then we have to modify the file to incorporate ethane and then type ethane twice likewise propane twice so is there a way to modify the whole thing or is there a way to introduce variables and that will make our lives very easy as such uh, so let's introduce something called as shell variable now and um, there are lots of shell variables that are already defined so let's see like first of them this is echo I, I, I type echo and then let's see uh, bash if I see if I type bash version if I press enter so echo basically is a print statement so echo and then you type this dollar sign and notice this dollar sign uh, now we'll talk about this as well notice this dollar sign and then there is no blank space over here bash version and then if you type uh, if you if you type this command onto wherever you are working you probably will see maybe a different number over there and that's okay uh, it depends upon the computer setups so some like when you install the updates the most recent version automatically gets installed so echo is one command it is like basically means print so let's create some shell variables now so let me see uh, pet equals to i'll write fido and then let's see legs equal to four and notice i am not putting any blank spaces over there and then if I type echo, then space dollar pet has dollar legs. If I press this, I will get an output Fido has four legs. So we set a variable with this equal to sign. And it is very important uh, to note that there are no spaces around equal to. And this could be really frustrating at times if you don't pay attention. It happened with me initially a lot. I would always put a 
blank space and then I would worry where the script is going wrong. Why is this not giving me the right answer? And then when we checked with our senior row, there's a blank space. So the blank space becomes, uh, it could be an Achilles heels at times. So make sure that when you are defining a variable, then there are no blank spaces around the equal to sign over there. And the other thing is, uh, you can see there is this dollar sign here. There is a blank space here. And then we write, and by default, when you go to the next line, you'll see this dollar sign. And then there is a by default blank space over here. Now, don't confuse this dollar sign with this dollar sign. This dollar sign where there is a blank space, this actually is a Linux prompt. So here, the computer is expecting some command to be entered. Whereas this dollar sign where there is no space, this is a shell variable, right? That's a very important difference to remember. A lot of times, this is the confusion point. This dollar is here, but when you see a dollar sign and then there is a by default space there, so that means it is a Linux prompt. And this is the Linux variable, All right? So yeah, that's what I just told you, right? So it's the same thing over there, the, exactly the same thing that is written onto a slide. So when you see a dollar sign, then a space, then that dollar sign represents a prompt. And where there is no space, then it is a variable. And variables are colored in this slide deck to help you to notice them. So how are we doing so far? Um, are Is everyone with me or? If there are any questions, okay, I see one green check mark, that's great, okay. All right, so yeah, but please feel free to uh, jump in if you need, if you ask, if you need to ask a question. All right, so let's, uh, let's basically modify our script now. And uh, let's introduce variables over there. So basically, we are going to edit this run new mall script or run new mall file. So how to edit a file? I'm going to use this nano editor, which is like the simplest editor. Nano run new mall. I'm just going to write that and press enter. So it's going to open up that file for me. And I'm going to modify this file instead of methane. I'm going to type dollar, where is dollar, dollar one dot in like that. And then this dollar one dot out here. And then I'm going to save this. So the way to save this is control. It's written right here, actually. You try to exit and then it will ask you to save or not. So I will press control X save modified buffer i'll press y and file name to write default is run no more and i'm just going to press enter and if i see now cat run no more and then i have that uh, change which is already now recorded over there now the way to run this file is still the same bash run new mall now because we have introduced a variable, it will expect you know some input towards that variable. So bash run new mall. I'm just going to type methane now here, and it's going to run that, and then it will come out of it. So dollar one is a positional parameter. It's like a special case of shell variable, and also it happens to be the first argument. And if there are multiple arguments, then you can simply type it like dollar two, dollar three, like that. And always check with, did you get the output? Yes, I did get the output. Now keep in mind, like we do see this is the time. So 9.33, the, this cluster is located in Montreal. So that's why we see the Eastern time there. And again, you might see some different times over there. So, so yeah, so we have kind of automated it slightly now. And uh, now um, you can see like the advantage over there, right? 
So instead of methane, I can just type ethane and uh, let it run again. So it will print out ethane dot out. It should print out ethane dot out. So let's see. And it does. So likewise, but still, I mean, we have this is slightly better than what we had initially, but still we have to type it each time. So the way to further modify it is to introduce loops. So we can just introduce loops and see how they help us. So, uh, and keep in mind, uh, loops are generally not very fast, but sometimes we really need to use them. So that's okay. Uh, let's 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 learn something about loop. So loop will always begin by this uh, very with this word called for for molecule in ethane, methane, and propane. So in this case, we just pick all three. And if I press uh, enter now, so I see this one. This is like a secondary prompt now. So the primary prompt was dollar, and then the secondary prompt is this greater than sign. So here I write do. This is what I want the program to do. Do bash run new mole over all molecule values. And then I would just say done. And if I press enter afterwards, so the program is going to run now and it should generate three outputs, methane, uh, ethane, methane, and propane, and then it should come out of the loop. And you can notice like it is not super fast, like it is kind of slow. Uh, reasons I've already told you, partly because I'm running on the login node of the cluster. And uh, and then the other thing is that shell itself is not very fast. So if I type ls minus ltr, so I've got like all the three files generated now, ethane, methane, and propane. Um, again, this was not, this was like a secondary prompt here. So that's why we do see a gap there. Well, in this case, uh, it is not a redirectional operator. It After a while, it will be clear like what is a redirectional operator and what actually is a prompt there. Okay. I mean, it is still better than what we were doing. Now we have to type it like just once. I mean, still just think about like if we have 200 files, how are we going to automate that code? Uh, so that's what we are uh, inching towards. So, so let's let's see. Um, there are these three input files, at least over here. And after what we do now, over the next like five ten minutes, you will realize like even if we have got two thousand files, the procedure is still the same. So let's see, so ls star dot in. If I do this, it's going to print on screen the input files for me. And then if I repeat this process, but I use a redirectional operator and type this output onto a file called as test set. So I will see what I get. So I get test set. So if I do this uh, nano test set, so you'll see the names of these input files are written uh, sequentially over there. Ethane, methane, and propane. That's one thing. And uh, uh, right. Um, right. So we've got like this ethane dot in, methane dot in, and propane dot in written. And when we were running our code, we were using just ethane, methane, and propane, right? We were we were kind of uh, we were ignoring dot in, dot in, dot in was not there. 
But when we when we typed star dot in onto test set, we get like in the output all these three dot ins as well. Now we want to get rid of this dot in over there. Now there are a couple of ways to do that. The first one we can use this operator right here. So control backslash, it will say search to replace. And I'm going to type dot in here. So it will it's going to do a search on all the lines dot in and then if I press enter here it will say replace with I want to replace it with nothing so I'm just going to simply press enter here and it is going to say replace this instance yes no all or cancel I'm just going to press capital A there so you see that dot in goes away so I am left with ethane, methane, and propane. That's what I need. And now I simply save this file. So control X, save modified buffer, yes. File name to write, text set, press enter. And I am left with that. So if I do cat test set, so I just have these three name these three molecule names written sequentially ethane methane and propane right so that is useful we would need this now and uh, this is a very useful feature of nano editor and likewise there are other editors like vi editor or emacs editor they have their own mechanism uh, so it is very important to learn about these different editors as well but the reason that we use nano here in these sessions is because this happens to be the most basic editor yet it gives a lot of options that we can really use. So we've got a file named as test set. And now let's uh, go back to our, our loop. So for molecule, now we don't have to type uh, individually ethane, methane, and propane. So I'm just going to say for molecule in, this is my variable now, cat test set. So cat test set, as we've seen, like cat test set is going to throw out all the variable names. So when this is initiated, first time it's going to produce, generate ethane, methane, and propane. And then I've got the secondary prompt, and I'm just going to do the same thing and echo. Uh, so we add a line so that we know the program is running. Echo working on the molecule name molecule and what do we want so we want bash run new mole on molecule this molecule and then i just simply type done here and if i press enter now so it is going to do that so working on ethane and then it will slowly go to the next line and then the next line. So now it's working on methane. And then, uh, yeah, working on propane. And once everything is done, then it will come out of it. So, uh, right, there we go. So what we did, so now you you can you can imagine now uh, like if we have to do this procedure over 200 files so all we have to do is we simply type like do an ls over all the input files and then make that modification that we made and then the loop is going to work on over 200 files right or maybe even 1000 files so we have kind of automated the procedure now so let's let's do a quick review what whatever we have done so far so we've got like these are the redirectional operators so this is the standard input and then the standard output and the way to set a variable or in this case the shell variable this is set with equal to sign but there should be no spaces uh, between these two values there and then printing a variable the command is echo positional argument and then we've got the loops done over there as well uh we uh did this command here ls star dot in 
I forgot to mention that the star over here is also called as the wild card. So it's a wild card file matching. So that's why one has to be careful because the star could mean wild card matching and uh, it is also used for multiplication. So, so those things. And then we've got the command substitution as well. That's what we did there, right? So this is a quick review of how to automate the program. If there are any questions at this time, or if everyone is with me, then please give me a green check mark. Or if there is anything that you want me to go over again, then we can move on to the part two. All right, are we good to move forward? Are people with me? Some green check marks. Okay, got at least one green check mark. Two, I'll start when I see four green check marks. Three, I need one more. Oops, it's been down. Okay. The green check marks actually tend to go away if you don't do anything, I believe. Anyways, so let's move on to like the part two and how do we extract the results now? Um, we will use some of the tricks that we have used so far. And I can tell you like this is one, this uh, like whatever we are going to talk about now, you will be using them a lot of times. Like when you are scrolling through big files, uh, sometimes the files are like really huge and the commands that we are going to talk about now, they are going to be extremely helpful in doing searching through the files. Especially this one, the grep, it's a very, very popular command. Let's do this. So let me, uh, let me clear my screen first and ls star dot out. If I do that, then I've got like three output files now with me. So ethane dot out, methane dot out, and propane dot out. So let's see what this grep does. So grep energy. If I type this energy and then star dot out. So it is going to scroll through all the output files in this particular case and search for that term energy. And it is going to print out all those lines where it finds energy, all right? Let me type it out, see that? So it searched through ethane.out and it found the state, the, the line with the term energy in there it printed it out. Likewise, it did for methane and propane. So as I said, this is like a very, very pow powerful command. Uh, grep actually searches a file or files for a pattern. So you can imagine like how you would be using this command over like a very big file. If you really want to find like a particular pattern, just run grep through it. Or even if there are thousand command thousand lines, just run grep through it. Okay, so that's the first command. And then we saw one way to edit uh, using the nano editor. And uh, now uh, let's see if I say this propane dot out. If I do a cat onto that, so it says oops, sorry. Okay. It says uh, uh, this is the first line, this is new mall, and then this, the energy is minus 11. By the way, this new mall happens to be, uh, this was actually, I should have told you at the beginning, our, uh, like our colleague, Ross Dixon, the who's the lead uh, of research consultants on our team, 
a very very popular uh, person so this used to be his program from his phd days and then for the for the for this lesson he actually developed this kind of a mini toy code that we could use it for the shell lesson this shell lesson was actually developed by ross initially uh, yeah so uh, so so let's see now uh, we if we want to get rid of this one like uh, something out of here it says the energy is minus 11 in this case now let's see i will first use grep energy and star dot out and i'm going to write it onto a file name as raw energies and then if I press enter over there, so if I see what is written in raw energies, I'll use cat. So raw energies has got three lines uh, because see, this is again, something very useful, which I should have, I should mention here. So I use this grep command and uh, it, and I use this command to make another file raw energies so it scroll through all the output files and search for that pattern and wrote that those patterns onto the file called as raw energies and now we are going to modify this raw energies file i want to get rid of this this whole thing over there dot out the energy is and uh, i just want to have a neat output over there so that i can present it to someone so the the another editor is called as sed s e d stream editor basically that's what it means stream editor single colon and uh, then i'll type lowercase s that stands for substitution so i'm just going to substitute uh, i'm just going to substitute dot out dot out the energy is and then this is this is the thing that i want to substitute with what with nothing so there's a blank space and then i just close it over there and then i close the colon not colon but the noted single quote and then i run so th this command over raw energies. Um, Sergey or uh, Joey, could you just please admit this person? Actually, I'm just just kind of box on my screen. Um, right. If I run this, so you see it. It basically eliminated this whole thing. Dot out the energy is that part. So this is the stream editor. It's not going to change the file, right? It's just sends the results to standard output in a different fashion over there. And then obviously I could have uh, like uh, added another stream, uh, another redirectional operator, and wrote this output onto a new file if I wanted to. But I want to uh, show show you something more meaningful over there. That's one way of, one other way of editing a file, right? Rather than using the nano editor. I mean, like some people don't even use nano editor, including me. Um, so, uh, so yeah, so, but I use this command said, or uh, there are other commands in other editors that you can use. So now um, that's one thing. And then one very powerful command is history. History three, in this case, it's going to print out the last three commands that I used. Now, this is so powerful. Sometimes what happens is like you are doing something, the command is like really big. And then after say 10, 15 days, you come back and then you forget like what the heck I was doing back then. And I didn't even wrote down what I was doing, the command itself. Sometimes the commands themselves are complicated this history will preserve like in my case over here it is already preserving more than 1000 last command so if i if i press enter history and then press enter so i 
just, just see that I can go back like this is what I have been doing over there. So the last, I don't know how many commands and this depends upon cluster to cluster. So usually if I type history 10, so it will print the last 10 commands for me. Uh, this, as I said, it could, it is like a very powerful command. I really love this command. Um, might also include time spread timestamps. I have not seen timestamps actually. Um, but history itself is quite powerful. So now let's join the commands together. So I mean, rather than doing things in two steps, we can actually do them in a single step. So let's see, let's start with grep. Oops. So grep, energy, um, star dot out. This is one command. And then this operator is called as the pipe operator. It takes the output of this particular command, passes it on to the next, passes it as an input onto the next command. So the next command is said, and then this is to go on to the next line as such. And then here I'm going to type substitution and a substitute dot out the energy is with nothing. And then type it onto the results. So once again, uh, you start from grep. So grep energy star dot out, it scrolls through all the output files, searches for that pattern. Once it has found that pattern, then it uses this pipe operator to pass to pass the output onto this next command. So said command will modify that uh, output, that energy line that was written, and then it will it's going to print onto the results. If I press enter, and then if I see uh, cat results, so it's going to print the same thing for me, ethane minus eight, methane minus five, propane minus 11. So pipe operator is a very powerful operator and it's just not that you can join, use this pipe operator over just two commands, but you can use it over multiple commands. So you can use grep and pipe, often they are used in tandem over multiple commands. Um, and then now if I do a history, let's see, history five. So I have this command printed onto my history as well. So imagine if I use this pipe operator five times onto a command, and then after 15 days, I'm forgetting, and then I can just open up my history and still copy paste this same command once again to do the analysis. And there is no time frame uh, after which the history is deleted. It, it is, there is no, nothing like that. And I honestly, I have no idea, like uh, depends upon the cluster, like there is a maximum number that you can, you can basically write it down. Let me, having said that, let me try this crazy thing. History 5000, does it? Okay, it's not going to do that. So I guess I am already reaching the limit. Anyways. So what we have learned so far, grep, it searches files for strings, said, this is the stream editor and substitution. So uh, this as small as stands for substitution, regular expression and the replacement. And then the prior commands you can check with history. The pipe commands, pipe output becomes input for the next command. So, uh, that's like the story so far. So we've got, uh, we started off from the bin bash and then, uh, yeah, so that's what we learned about like the loops and then the standard editors. And then we learned about the grep command, pipe command, set command. All right. So these, like these are the main takeaways of today's session. So how do we automate 
or make the repetitive actions and write them onto a script and extract and combine results from multiple files. For that, we use grep and then we edit the streams of text to remove the unwanted stuff with said. And then we can combine uh, this is a command substitution and then we've got the pipe. So we haven't talked about interfacing with the scheduler yet. So let's do that. Now, uh, the goal was to submit the job onto the onto the compute nodes, right? Or onto the scheduler over there. So uh, simple. Now you are going to learn more about these job scripts in tomorrow's session uh, with Oliver and Ross. And uh, a very, like today, I'm just going to demonstrate like a very tiny bit of how like right now, like when I was submitting, let's say, cat run new mall. So this one, I was actually submitting onto, onto, onto the login node. So if I were to submit this job uh, onto the compute node, so how can we do that? So cat new mall job. So let me copy first, I use CP run new mall. I'm just going to copy it onto new mall job for me. And then let me edit this nano new mall job. Oops, sorry. What happened there? Yeah. So this first line stays intact, bin bash, and then the next line. This is called as this, I'll type S batch. And then I have to give a time here, dot dash dash time. In this case, the time, I'm just going to give, the first is hours. And then we've got minutes and then we've got seconds over there. So this is the simplest bash script or batch script, which actually we'll be submitting onto the cluster. And uh, let me save this now. Control X, save modified for yes, new mall job, press enter. And the command that I use now is s batch. If I do that, now I am working on a cluster. So I have to specify an account as well. So in this case, I'm just going to use my account. Uh, but you may not, you may skip this, this line or this step if you are working on the magic cluster, magic castle cluster. So S batch, and then just type the some script name, new mall, new mall job. And then if I type methane here, and press enter so it will say submitted batch job and if i press sq now so you i'll see that my job has been submitted onto the queue now when this will run this will run on the compute node rather than on the login node so this is how we submit the jobs to the scheduler as i said we'll learn more about this tomorrow and right now it is sitting under priority when it time when the time comes and when the job runs this pd will change to r and then when the job is over then obviously it will be it will not show up over there so a loop inside a job script so basically that's what we can do and also i can simply uh, let me see so I can cancel this for now as cancel minus U G sync. So this, uh, it will cancel all the jobs. So because let's, uh, let's modify that script furthermore. So let, let us uh, do that. So cat new mall job.
Fuck that. I need nano actually. Sorry about that. So in this case, uh, these two lines will still remain the same. And also I can actually uh, uh, add more sbatch commands over here as well. Like in this case, I can type my account name, def gcing ab right there. And then uh, we will just do this command here. So for molecule in, in and then bracket there, cat test set, and then it says do the next line dot slash numol takes the input from this variable. Now you have to be careful with the brackets there when you are typing here. So I'm so here you can see there we've got braces dot in. Sometimes these braces uh, probably give you an error. So you probably have to see like which of the brackets are going to work here. And this is something I always find very confusing as such. Uh, but I'm I hope this is actually right. And then because I did test it, so it should be fine. So molecule dot out is the same thing there. And then in the next line, type done. And I don't need this line, so I'm going to get rid of this. So cat test set is all test set is already there. So I'll just save this control X. Yes, yes. And I'll just check cat test set. Is it still there? Yes, it is still there. And cat new mall, new mall job. Yeah, so it's going to take the name and then it's going to print the output as well. And now I'm going to submit it onto the queue again. So S batch new mall job this time. And I simply press enter after that. Oops. Um, Oh, there is a typo actually in the nano normal job. So it should be equal to there rather than a minus sign. And now it should be fine. Control X, yes. And let's submit this job now. So it goes in the queue now. So it will still show up. It's still showing the PD, but that's this job is going to run now. So um there are other ways as mentioned over here so there are these job arrays and uh, like GNU, gnu parallel glossed meta so these are like if there are a lot of small tasks lot means like in the region of thousands or ten thousands uh we've got documentation to help you out and also uh, you can always send an email to us and then if there are any questions on to that. So job arrays, I, well, I mean, like, uh, I think job arrays is like if there are a lot of jobs uh, that you want to submit at once, like uh, instead of, uh, let's say, three files over here, if there are like three million files, right, then rather than submitting one by one, the better way is to submit such jobs, such high number of jobs through job arrays. I think there is a script here already. So that array job, so nano array job, we are almost at the end anyways. So this is the, this is the array job which we can use. Um, still doing the, going to do the same thing for you. So you will see in this case, there are three, molecules so s batch array goes from one to three it will submit jobs in chunks so like uh, on the clusters the maximum number of jobs that you can submit at one time is 1000 most clusters actually so each of these jobs is going to run for five minutes over here and then there are these three jobs over there so uh, so it so in this case, I have to specify my account name there. So let me do that as batch 
account def gsing avi do that and then control x yes yes and let me see so that job is still in queue i'm just going to cancel this and i can submit an array job like that as batch array job so if i do sq so you will see like three jobs have been submitted and they will kind of uh, run on different cpus this is the big difference there like uh, the earlier jobs they were submitted in a way the fashion in way they were submitted it's kind of sequential so it will run the first job then it will go to the second job then it will go to the third job in this case three jobs will start if there are three cpus available in tandem at the same time so you can imagine like if there are 200 files and if there are 200 cpus available you know the whole of the job could be done in five minutes otherwise you have to sit for five times 200 that many minutes so that's where the power of the cluster comes to comes comes really into its own so even though sometimes people say that our laptops are faster than the clusters but yeah that may be true uh, your most recent laptop CPU speed might be faster than that is on the cluster, but then don't forget on a cluster, there are like thousands of CPUs that are available. So it's not one-on-one, -on -one, but uh, when you look at the totality as such, you can do uh, like a lot of stuff in a short span of time. That's where the cluster usually comes into its own. And then what we have learned today to write small scripts that would automate your programming uh, capabilities, it's going to be of enormous help as you move forward. So I think uh, we've got we've reached the end of uh, the session today. So if there is a like technical wiki, probably most of you know, and there is also this user support line. You can always send us uh, emails if there are any questions onto these two email IDs and one of us will always be there to help you out and uh, yeah so give a feedback when you get our email that is also important and with that i will hand over back to tanya and thank you very much for paying the attention today thank you Kripa. that was a great session mm -hmm. and thanks joey and sergey for all the help today uh and thank everyone for for coming to the session today. So yeah, like Rupert said, uh, we want to, to ask you to fill out the feedback form that is, it's now available in the learning portal under the course outline. So after the Zoom session, you're gonna be able to see our feedback form there. So yeah, we are really appreciate your feedback as that's how we determine uh, what type of training we offer in the future, right? And uh, yeah, and also I'm gonna paste the link of our upcoming training in the chat. We encourage everyone to register and to attend the the the, um, the last session for the ASNet Basics tomorrow, which is the uh, job scheduling with Storm. And also in October, we're gonna be offering introductory programming with Python, two sessions, and uh, the Unix shell. And we also have four sessions of cloud. So yeah, check it out and register. So yeah, let us know if you have any more questions. We're here to help you out. Thank you. Stop the recording, I guess. Yes.